Hi everyone, Kathy Beltran with Sacred Dance of Chan, of, with Tran, sorry, um, as well as with um, Trans Development Support Group. I am so grateful to have Martin Twycross here with us. Um, he is, oh, I've been waiting to interview him. And he is a wonderful spiritual medium, teacher, tutor with the Arthur Finley College. Um, oh my God, I'm gonna be talking nonstop about him and all his services because you guys already know, you've seen my posts about practically owning every digital DVD, you know, series that he offers with mediumship, psychic, and especially trance. Oh my God, so we will talk a lot about that a little bit later, but everybody, Martin Twycross. Thank you, Kathy. Lovely to be here. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. Um, it's my I figured, pleasure. I figured we were just going to have, you know, I'm going to throw some questions at you. We're going to have a great yeah, conversation. Yeah, go for it. And um, I figure we would start off, since we are doing this about trance. Um, yeah. um, what is your definition of trance and mediumship? Oh, well, there you go. That's, that's, that's a big question, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yes. And you, you're, in, you're in the States, and I think in the States, the Maybe quite a different definition from what we have in the UK because I found that. yes, it is true. You also got you guys also have an idea called channeling, which we do not have in the UK at all. And for me, channeling seems to encompass a lot of things that I wouldn't necessarily term as trance. So I, I often talk about trance as being an altered state. I talk about it as being a passive state, and generally for me, the eyes will be closed with trance. And generally, when I watch somebody in trance, I'd expect them to be pretty much passive. If someone's walking around the room and racing around the room, that for me is what I'd call more of an inspirational state, more of what we can may call an overshadowed state. But it's not what I would call a trance state. For me, being an old school trained medium, trance is where we sit in a chair and we become very passive. And the aim is to still our minds and the aim is to still our bodies and allow a blending of spirit with our minds to use us for whatever they wish to use us for. And however that's said in things like trans healing, the medium may be animated, may be moving, may be talking to the person. So this what we call light trance, medium trance and deep trance, I guess. Mm -hmm. And for me, I guess what you guys have as channeling would maybe fall into a state of overshadowing or light trance. But I, I'm kind of more interested in a medium to deep trance state mm -hmm. as what I would call trans mediumship. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I like how you've said old school because I have noticed that from everybody that I speak with outside of the U.S., um, there or the ones that are, have, I have interviewed, they are old school. I mean, they really do talk about the, um, the medium to deeper states, and that's what they're looking at. And um, so I do agree with you. I think there is different interpretations from where we are in the U.S. to there. Um, yeah. And I love that you mentioned that. I really do. Um, and I do agree. I do. My interpretation, I think I'm more into the old school method. And so I do feel that you, it is passive. And that's why I keep talking about your, your DVDs and how wonderful they were for me. Um, I, I hope they're wonderful for everybody. Oh, oh my gosh. Yes. That's what I'm telling you. That's why I'm going to definitely have you uh, put your links in there because absolutely wonderful information and um, services that you offer. Wonderful. What inspired your trans journey or development? Um, well, shall I talk about my trans journey in yeah. the big picture? Because I guess you'll understand quite a few things yeah. along the way. Um, for me, my first experience of trans actually took place in about 1996, when I had no real interest in spiritualism and no real interest in pursuing mediumship. It just happened that I shared a house with a guy. Uh, I was... Uh, a group of us were sharing a house and he was a spiritualist and he used to go to church every week. And I used to say he was crazy because he went to church every week, and <laughs> that he was crazy because he believed in mediums. And eventually he persuaded me with to go along to the church one day. And it was a demonstration of transfiguration and trans and transfiguration for any of your viewers who don't understand what that is. It's a form of physical mediumship. And the idea is, is that an ectoplasmic mask builds up over the face of the medium and that the features of a loved one are then impressed upon that mask and should be visible to the whole room. Physical mediumship being objective, everybody should see it. That's the idea. And he said, because you're a non-believer, Martin, even you should be able to come along and see this. So I said, great, because I'm very scientifically trained. For anyone who doesn't know me, I've got a, 
a degree in physics. I've got a background in science. And, you know, I, for me, you've got to show me evidence to, for, before I believe anything. If you like, you, a lot of people call me a skeptical medium, which I think is a wonderful, a wonderful phrase. Yes. So I, I went along with my scientific mind and I saw nothing other than a man gurning and be, with his eyes shut talking in strange foreign voices, trying to be a Native American, trying to be whoever. And I just thought it was crazy. And I remember saying to this guy, you're all deluded. All of you are deluded. And they're saying, well, didn't you see the faces appear? And I said, no, I just saw this guy gurning. And what I realized later is, is that true transfiguration mediumship is very, very rare. So what I was witnessing was people were watching things clairvoyantly with their own clairvoyant uh, sense. So they developed some degree of uh, mediumship or psychic awareness, and they were using their clairvoyant vision to see it. I didn't have any of that because I wasn't developed at all. I saw nothing. You saw nothing. Wow. So that was my first experience with trance, and it wasn't a particularly positive one. And then I, 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 I found uh, mediumship and spiritualism in 2001. I first went to uh, my local spiritualist church following the passing of my mum. That was, for me, the trigger that unfolded my own mediumship. And it was three weeks after she passed that I went along to the spiritualist church and I received a wonderful message from her within three weeks. Wow. And I then sat, started sitting for my own development in circle uh, within another two weeks of that. Wow. Okay. And so get, that would have been my, my next question is how long have you been doing this? How long have you been on your spiritual journey? Or, you, you know, since, yes, yeah, since 2001. And I actually gave my first contact from spirit within six weeks of first attending the church. So it all happened very rapidly, yeah, very yeah. rapidly indeed. Yes, it did. And you know what? There are some people that take forever to open up and develop. And there are some that it's meant to be, it's, it's their time. And it just naturally, just naturally opens and is able to not have, you know, develop for so long and have this experience and be able to deliver yeah. messages. So you yeah. don't have them. And I talk about right conditions, right timing. And I guess that was my right time, mm -hmm. the right conditions. Well, so, yeah. so following that really, um, my next experience was with uh, a gentleman, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, a gentleman called Colin Fry. Mm -hmm. And I went to one of his workshops at our local church back in the day before he was famous and he used to do a lot of church workshops. And he gave me a, a spiritual appraisal. And a spiritual appraisal is basically where you look at the energies of someone and look at what's present within their energy. And he kept saying how intriguing I was to him because... I, w I, would, I wouldn't specialize in one thing. I would do everything, was what he kept saying. Wow. He said, you've got a fascinating energy. You're going to do everything. And, uh, and then the next, the, the first demonstration I saw that impressed me was a demonstration of trance by Colin Fry. And many people didn't realize that Colin Fry was the first and foremost a physical and a trans medium before he ever found fame on TV in the UK and overseas. And Colin Fry... Uh, there are a series of videos out with him where his trans, his, he does trance and his guide Magnus speaks. And I, I purchased those and I was very impressed by them. And I, I saw several demonstrations by Colin and that really intrigued me as to what mediumship, trans mediumship was about. Well, I think it's kind of amazing that, you know, in your beginning, you get this, uh, what kind of reading from him and to know that you have that energy within you to do so many different things and have this, uh, uh, this to go in to any direction. Um, that must've been really cool to hear that in the beginning of your journey. So you've got to remember though, I'm, I'm a skeptical medium <laughs> and a lot of people tell me a lot of things. The number of people have told me that I will be this, be that, be the other. I take a lot of it with a pinch of salt to be truthful because and again, with Colin, yeah, I, I respect him as a medium, but I didn't necessarily think, well, I'm going to believe him because for me, I, I will let it unfold the way it unfolds and it will happen the way it happens. And whether anyone tells me I'll do this, do that, do the other, I've been told everything that, you know, I was going to be an amazing physical medium. I would be, you know, head of the SNU, the, the organization in the UK that I'd, you know, I told crazy things. And I thought to myself, no, this is just too much. I don't, I don't believe any of it. <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Um, I think that if I look at you now, I mean, I obviously I didn't know you when you were, you know, younger, but 
I mean, all the things that you're doing now, I mean, you are a great teacher. And I can say that just because I, I'm, I'm learning from your videos. Um, yep, I'll, I'll let you say that. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, there's these YouTube little bits of pieces about the videos that you share. Um, yeah. A lot of my friends are like, oh, my God, you got the videos. <laughs> yes, they're not all on YouTube. He's not going to put them all on there. But it's no, they're, they're 10 minute clips on YouTube. They're yeah. kind of in fact, it's a funny story how they came about. I actually I developed this series of videos uh, in my, through my own development in that I realized that people weren't really teaching the theory behind mediumship and it bothered me. And so I decided to try and develop, a, if you like, a little course, which I delivered in my church. And those original videos were never intended to be videos for a wider audience. They were, the classes were done within my local church and some people couldn't make the series of classes. So I just said, well, I'll put a video camera in the room and you can get them on video if you want to watch them later on. And, and then I decided that actually there's a bigger audience for these videos that really need to go much bigger than just a few people in the church. Yes. And so I originally kind of put them together and packaged them. And the very first time I ever advertised them, I got some really um, critical feedback, should we say. Somebody said, I think I remember posting, I've done some mediumship videos for anyone who's interested in the theory of mediumship. Mm -hmm. And the first post back was, my God, how much? Who are you to do them? And all this sort of stuff. And I thought, oh my God. Wow. So I thought, and I, welcome to the world of spiritualism and not necessarily spiritual people. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, you know what? I do want to bring up one other thing is, I love because, the, you know, when I look at your website and you have this thing, you wanted it to be affordable. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? And I, I was talking with you before we started about, I mean, all your, I mean, I, I mean, unless you put in more in the past, maybe month, um, I actually have every one of them, but it was so affordable to buy all of them versus going to a teacher or signing up with somebody and, you know, 700, $1,000, but yeah. it's great information. And, and some people need it the way you present it, you know, like how you say you're skeptical, but you, you it's so detailed. And well, I, I have a logical analytical mind and I like to present the information in a way that makes sense. And I don't really like doing anything fluffy. I don't like to talk about woolly things, things that can't be proved. And I'm a huge fan of um, Harry Edwards and Harry Edwards was a wonderful healer. And he looked at all the healing practices of the time and he stripped out all the stuff that was unnecessary. And if you like, that's the mentality I apply in my own teaching to all forms of mediumship. If it's not necessary, why bother? Let's strip it all away. And that's how I kind of present my teachings. And just coming back to what I was saying earlier on, when, these, when I posted these, this advertising on this forum and people were quite, let's just say, not entirely embracing the idea of me, me doing these videos, um, I just thought the easiest way to let people know what they were getting was to cut out 10 minute excerpts of each video and upload them to YouTube and then say, this is what they're like. They typically last two hours. Here's a free 10 minute spot. Have a look, see what you think. And if you like them, you may buy them. And that, I thought that was a, a way of also giving something for free as well, because I think it's important that we give things. We don't put it all behind the barrier of cost, if you see what I'm saying. Yes. And I actually, people said to me, you've kind of given the best bit for nothing. In your videos, you've kind of given the core bit for nothing. And I said, well, if, if people, some people won't ever buy them. So if they just watch those 10 minute clips, they're still going to get a pretty good understanding of what it's about. So that it was deliberate, really. Well, it's, not, it's nice to be generous. Well, no, and that's wonderful. But like I said, uh, that's where I saw your videos. And yep. that's when I decided to go ahead and do that. And I've studied with other teachers, but, you know, it's great to study with other people too and get a different... Yeah. Take, you know, um, it is very important. Um, so let me ask you, is there an area of trance um, that you're more interested in developing or that you developed? Um, are you into the healing part, the physical mediumship, as such? Well, with my own journey, I first developed um, evidential mediumship, what you, the mediumship you see on platforms and sittings. That and healing were the first two things I developed, which pretty much alongside each other. And, at the time, I was told by some people, you can't develop them both at the same time. You've got to develop one or the other. And I just said, well, hang on a minute. All these famous mediums were both healers and mediums. So it's crazy to say that. So I developed both in parallel. And I had no real intention of developing trance up front, to be truthful. And I actually got invited in 2002. So maybe six months after I first started development 
into a trans circle. And uh, it was the first closed circle I was ever invited into. And I was a bit unsure about whether I should go. Was it right for me? Do I really want to develop trans? And the answer was, well, not really. And but I went anyway. And so I went into this circle and there's probably about six of us in the circle. And I was really there to give energy to the other mediums who were already developing trans. So I was kind of a sitter to give the energy, the power. And I ended up speaking and, you know, and it wasn't really expected that this new guy who shouldn't be doing anything would talk. So I went to the circle and I began speaking. And if you like, that was the first sign I had that there was a potential for me with trans. And, but then I, I didn't stay in the circle for very long, to be honest, only a matter of weeks, I guess six weeks. Uh, I was very aware early on that energies are so vitally important. And some people came and joined the circle whose energies I wasn't particularly comfortable with. And I no longer felt comfortable. I felt it was probably, given I really wasn't that excited about developing trance at the time. And the, I didn't really feel the energy was right for me. I felt it was probably better I stepped back from the circle. But at that point, I had a glimpse that, yeah, you know, there's potential for you to do trance here. It's there within your energy. So I knew at that point that, yeah, maybe trance is, a, is something I could do in the future. But I never really got, I didn't really start developing proper till about 2008 when I began to sit properly for trance and made a decision. And for me, what really excites me with trance is trance philosophy. I'm a huge fan of Silver Birch. And Silver Birch was the guide of the medium Morris Barbanel. And I believe the teachings of Silver Birch, the books of Silver Birch are the best things. I just, I love them. So I have them all. I've tracked down even the rare, hard to find copies. And I love Silver Birch and the teachings. And for me, that's, that's what is possible with trance. So I kind of like hold that as the gold standard. And maybe one day we can achieve something similar, but maybe not. Who knows? I love the philosophy part. I love Absolutely. that. I get information, I read. It's just amazing to me. Um, so with that, um, when you mentioned, you mentioned that um, when you were sitting in circle, do you have to have that connection with the people in a circle? Do you have to vibe with them? Absolutely. For me, I believe that in developing trance, the most important thing is a harmonious group of people. And if it's not harmonious, it will restrict the development. And also within, within a circle, first of all, I should say for a, about a circle, you don't actually have to sit in a circle. A lot of people think we better sit in a circle. And, it's, you know, my, the circle I sit in, uh, whoever's sitting to be doing mediumship sits in a chair and everybody else just faces them. So it's, it's not a circle as such. So some people think we better sit in a circle, but... I don't sit in circles personally. Okay. It's a, it's not, it's not a physical circle. And that's actually good to know. Because, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you, what is your interpretation of sitting in the power or sitting for spirit? Now that's, that's a huge one. And if I take you back to my own development, I did this, uh, this trans circle in 2002 briefly, and I saw the potential there within myself. I decided that it wasn't really for me. But then what I did do was I recognized the importance of sitting in the power for all forms of mediumship. I recognized that sitting in the power was core to mediumship. Whether you want to develop as an evidential medium, whether you wish to do trance, whether you wish to do healing, and you wish to do inspirational work, all of it requires a blending and attunement with spirit. So for me, I recognized that sitting to blend First of all, with the spirit and soul that we are, you've got to get to know your understand, understand your own energy and understand that really you're more than the body, that you are spirit, that you are this wonderful soul, that you connect so much more beyond what we believe we are within this body. So you do that by sitting in your own power. And then we sit to tune and blend with the spirit world. And that's the next stage. And when I heard about sitting in the power, to be honest, I was a bit of a lazy medium. I, I shouldn't tell you this, but I still am. <laughs> <laughs> and so we decided that rather than us sitting at home in our own time, we'd come together and have a circle within the church. And we'd all sit at the same time in the circle within the church. And that's what we did for a couple of years, really, a few years. We all would come uh, regularly and sit together within the circle, within the church to build power. And we were seeking to build our own power, not a group power. But it's interesting that it was the people 
or some of the people who was in that sitting at the, what we call the power circles, what we called it, it was some of those who actually went to form the trans circle. And we'd already developed this power together, this blending together, this harmonious blend together by sitting within this previous circle. And then it was a natural extension to take that to trance, really. And for me, it showed me that sitting in the power is such a vital step in doing it. If you think you can go develop trance and you don't sit in the power, then be prepared to not get very interesting results, I would say. You know, at the end of the day, sitting in the power is, is the core to all forms of mediumship. Absolutely, in my view. Can you develop any form of mediumship without ever sitting in the power? Well, yes, you can. I gave a few messages within six weeks without ever having sat in the power. I went into a trance state in a, my first circle without really sitting in the power properly. So yeah, it's possible. But if you're really serious about your development, yeah, sitting in the power is an absolute must. And you know, I think I kind of explained my version of sitting in the power is where, first of all, we sit within the power of our own soul. And really we need to get used to that. And if you like, we expand and build our own power and we take that power to the spirit world. I kind of go up, but spirit world is all around us. You know, it's just a, it's a shift of awareness to then move and blend with the spirit world. Does it all make sense? Yes, it absolutely does. And I, think I, I like how you said it. You have to sit for your own power, sit there. I mean, get to know your own energy, connect yeah. with spirit, sit for, you know, get to get that power and build as a group. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I believe it. And I want to go back to what you said. You talked about, you know, you didn't sit for the power You in the beginning. You had these experiences. But uh, what I say is that I think you had those experiences to show you, to get you to um, maybe go, oh, whoa, what, what is that? I need to, I mean, they were meant to happen for you because obviously where you are now. Um, so I kind of think, I think these experiences that happened to people in the very beginning without properly developing you know, um, in the beginning is a, a sign for them to, to say, Hey, this is your purpose. This is what is going to happen with you. So those people that had those spontaneous, um, that was like one of my questions I was going to ask you anyway. Um, I think it just happens because it's supposed to happen, you know, and to push you on your path, which you're completely on. Yeah. And I, I agree with that. I think spirit will often give us a glimpse of the potential that That's exists cool. within us. Yes. That is perfectly and some people call it a spiritual sweetie, which I, it sounds a bit corny. You know, <laughs> here, have a sweetie. And really what, what, what I find is all the conditions needed to make it happen come into play and it surfaces and you see it and you go, wow. But then you try and do it again and you can't. And what happens is it's almost like, here's your potential. We've put the conditions together to show you your potential, to give you an experience. Now it's up to you, do you want that experience? And it's up to you, are you willing to put in the time, the effort, the dedication, the patience to build the conditions needed for that to happen? And that, that's what I believe. And if I can come back to spontaneous trance, uh, Morris Barbonell, uh, the famous medium for Silver Birch, uh, he first went to a meeting of spiritualists to debunk it. He was a skeptic. He didn't believe in it and he went along to debunk it and he went into trance and Silver Birch spoke. Wow. Totally, totally spontaneous. He had no intention of that happening. Another well-known medium, Leslie Flint, who is a very well-known physical medium, a voice medium, uh, most, one of the most famous voice mediums we ever had, perhaps the most famous. Again, he went to a circle. He sat in a circle and again, he went into trance spontaneously, never again, not really wanting to do it. It happened. Uh, Gordon Higginson, another medium, his first experience of trance was when he was working on platform, was meant to do an address, and he went into trance, and he, he was very worried because his mum wouldn't let him go into trance. <laughs> and she, was, she said he wasn't allowed, and it happened. And he said, I was really worried because I, I just thought my mum's going to kill me. I've got into trance, and I, at the time, I think he was quite young, maybe 16, 17, 18. So it was quite young, and again, it was a completely spontaneous thing. It happened. But I believe it's there to give you that glimpse of your potential. Yes, yes. That's what I believe. Yes, I, I agree with you with that. Um, are you currently developing or continuing on with your development um, in a circle or on your own? Yeah, but basically uh, we never stop developing. Nobody, I think, for me, I always view um, your development as a journey. 
there is never a destination point when you can say, hey, I've arrived, I can do it now. Um, you know, I know that with all aspects of my mediumship, whether it's evidential mediumship, whether it's healing, whether it's inspiration, whether it's trance, whatever it is, there's more to come and I can develop it. So we, we always have to develop. And with my trance, I, I sit in a trance circle regularly, a couple of times per month. And, you know, it, I have to say trance changes as well. You know, all aspects of mediumship change over time. It never stays static. And my own trans mediumship changes as well. I can, I can tell you some really interesting changes later if you want me to. That's taking place within my own development. But I think it's helpful for people to understand that our mediumship is forever changing. And if you ever think that your mediumship will stay the same, if it does stay the same, it will limit you. It has to change for you to grow. And in growing, it changes. So it, the two are intertwined, if that makes sense. constantly going to be learning forever. There's Absolutely. It's going to change on you um how long after sitting in circle um most of the members want to know this because they're like they're still starting they might have just started and they you know they think that you know maybe they might have an experience in like two days um, <laughs> how long before you started experiencing um uh, anything within your circle um such as voices you know lights things like that so I, I guess, you know, what we need to talk about with experiencing things is understanding, first of all, that when we have energy within the circle, provided we've developed our psychic awareness, we can experience that energy. We can, some people who are very clairvoyant can see colors or lights or see things with people. People who are very clairsentient, they feel the energy in the room. They feel the energy changes. If you bring somebody in like I was originally with no development whatsoever, they go, I can't feel anything. And why is this guy talking about lights and seeing all this stuff, these colors around the medium when I can't see anything? And some of the people I used to sit with originally, they'd say, oh, I'm seeing the most beautiful blue with a medium. And I'm going, I'm seeing nothing. I see nothing. And they're seeing, oh, there's this wonderful guide appeared and stood right next to them. And I'm like, I see nothing. And that's even with developed, I was a developed medium at that point. I was working platform. I was, you know, and I still, I didn't see a thing. And that's because my, clairvoyance doesn't really function in that way. Mm -hmm. So what they were getting, and it, it's a perception of the energy. The energy is there and some people perceive it through clairvoyant vision. Some people, I perceive it more through clairsentience, through feeling. I feel the energy first and foremost. I very rarely see the energy with people. Although I can see spirit lights if those lights are created by spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and I can also, obviously phenomena within the room like cracking, cracks, noises, you can hear that. But we have to differentiate what's normal building movement on a cold night when it heats up versus what may be spirit generated movement. So, so, you know, sorry, spirit generated noises. So some spirit generated noises are so loud that everyone jumps out of their skin and it's like, whoa. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's just not a little creak within the corner of the room. That is like profound. So we have to talk about the different types of phenomena. So with the very first circle I sat in, perhaps on the second or third circle, I went into trance and started speaking. As we say, that was my spiritual sweetie. It didn't happen again. <laughs> I, I, I didn't have another opportunity. I didn't have another opportunity within that circle because I didn't really stay in that circle for long. So then I left. And then I really didn't start sitting properly for trance until 2008. And probably I'd say for the first half dozen circles, I didn't speak. So there was nothing for the first half dozen, although people could see energies, feel things within the room, but they were developed as mediums. So it developed, they developed their psychic awareness, their psychic ability. So they can feel that. Mm -hmm. And I would, when they were saying, we'd all talk about what we got afterwards and we'd say, what did you get? But really most people to begin with didn't get a great deal. But to begin with, we had six people sitting. And within the space of say two, two and a half hours, each person has to have their ch chance in the chair. And the energy, the power within the room gets split six ways. And it, it limits the time you have and it limits how much spirit can do with us. And for me, we talked about sitting in the power. And one thing I forgot to mention, which I should have done, is that when we sit for spirit, we enable our guides and helpers to blend with us, to get to know us, to get to know our minds, to get to know our energy, to get to learn to blend with us. And that's vital. And then when we're sitting to do... In a tr to develop trance, 
it's an extension of that. They're sitting to blend, come with us, to blend with our energies and ultimately to control us, to speak through us, to do what they wish to do. So it's just an extension of that close attunement we make with them, if that makes sense. Yes. So sitting is vital. So that's a precursor. But then when we're in the circle, we then need to spend that time blending and it will take time for them to learn to blend with us. So we shouldn't be surprised that it takes a while for phenomena to happen. And even when we speak for the first time, maybe I spoke after, um, say, six, 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 the sixth circle. Now, I'm, you know, I'm quite technical and I love to record all my circles. I, I have a digital recorder in the room so I can listen to what's said because when I'm in an altered state, I don't always hear things the way I would in a normal state. So I like to listen to what's said and go back over it again later. And to be truthful, the words that came out of my mouth in the early stages were not very good. I would call them lousy. I would sometimes say you've got to go through a period of dross before you'll start getting onto the quality, the precious metal. You know, we, if you like, we have to get used to speaking. We have to get used to allowing that blend to happen. And most of the time, there's a great portion of our own mind in the mix. And in the early stages, it's mostly our own mind, I believe. And then as we learn to develop that closer and closer blend and attunement, the percentage of us minimizes down. I don't think we ever get rid of us, but I believe it minimizes a lot. So in the early stages, people listening to it would say, well, I don't think much of him then. That's just kind of spiritual niceties. And what tends to happen is we, we say what we think we should be saying. You know, if you've read Silver Birch, you come out with some nice spiritual words or, you know, what tends to happen is what we think should happen. And we don't allow spirit to do what they want to do. So for me, um, the speaking took a while, took maybe six months before I was speaking because I was only sitting once a month to begin with. But then there was very little phenomena in the room other than what was perceived through people's psychic awareness. Maybe after about a year, we started to have some unusual phenomena. One of the most amazing things we had was I actually sat in the dark, which I don't normally do. I very rarely do that, but we sat in the dark just for a bit of, you know, to experience what would happen. And some light appeared in the room on the wall and a guide's face appeared within the light and it was animated and moving. Wow. And at that point, I wish I'd had a video camera in the room oh. as well. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Wow. But it, it's only happened once. It's never, ever happened again. And maybe that was a spiritual sweetie. Who knows? Yes. But I don't, I don't sit in the dark. And to be honest, I don't have, I, you asked earlier on about what types of, uh, of mediumship within trance I'm interested in. And for me, I love the philosophy. I, philosophy is fabulous. I love trance healing as well. You know, trance healing is just an extension of regular healing. It's just a deepening of the attunement. So healing as well is a wonderful thing. Uh, I love the inspiration, the philosophy, inspirational speaking. I love that. Uh, so I, I'm kind of interested in all of it. And I'd say the only bit that really never appeals for me is physical mediumship because I know it takes such a huge amount of time to develop. It, need, it's a, it needs a slightly different type of circle. And for the circles I do are there for the guides to speak and to bring forward philosophy, to bring forward guidance. To I get a lot of guidance from my own mediumship through the guides. You know, for, it's a huge benefit to me. And that's kind of what really intrigues me. But the physical, you know, again, I think only a certain number of people will have the potential to do fabulous physical mediumship. And... Um, I'm not a huge one for sitting in the dark and maybe I haven't got the patience for it neither. That's the other thing. So it's not, it's not an area that I've looked at. Maybe in the future, who knows? Never say never. But maybe that night with that light, who knows? Maybe that was a glimpse of potentials. I don't know. I don't know, but you know what? I, I agree with you. I like, I am really into the, the healing part, the philosophy. Those are my yep. main areas. I have not ever sat in the dark. Um, I'm not really drawn there yet. And I don't know if I ever will be, but um, I like how you explained um, this to other members. There's so many different areas. Um, and you did, and actually, um, you, you sit like what, um, once or twice a month? Because yeah. what's happening is I'm looking at my questions and I'm like, oh man, where did I stop? Because 
you're doing it. What's happening is I noticed with all the interviews, yep. someone knows exactly what's going on and they're just answering on the call, right? What, okay, I was at nine, now I'm at 17, you know? <laughs> so, don't, don't worry, we, we, we can cover off anything we don't cover. But just speaking there, some, some interesting things came to my mind that some people think you've got to develop trance in the dark and you don't. You know, too bright a light can actually be a detriment to the process. If, it, if it's too bright for your eyes and it can affect you, then it's too bright and turn it down a bit. But it doesn't have to be really, really low and it doesn't have to be darkness. And some people think if I'm going to sit, I have to sit in a cabinet. If I'm going to sit, I have to sit in the dark. And I don't sit in a cabinet. And I, to be honest, um, you only need to sit in a cabinet if you're trying to develop physical mediumship. Because the physical mediumship, if you like, it's, a, it's to condense and hold the energies that build up around the medium. So if you're just sitting to develop philosophy, you don't need a cabinet. And if you're sitting to develop trans healing, you definitely don't need any of that. I'm glad <laughs> that you said that. I actually sat in a cabinet and um, the energy was very strong. I mean, from what I'm, I'm used to sitting outside, I'm never really sat in a cabinet. So when I went in there, I could feel that energy like here. It was like crazy, just so strong for me. Um, but I'm glad that you mentioned that, that typically they sit in a cabinet for physical mediumship. Yeah. Um, and that's important for members to know and understand that they don't have to have a cabinet. Um, Absolutely. So. But, but when you say you experience sitting in the cabinet and you experience the energy around you, if you sit within the cabinet, it will alter your experience because the energy does build around you. Even with trance, the energy builds and you feel it differently. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying to people, do not sit in a, in a cabinet. What I'm saying is if you wish to sit in a cabinet, it's fine, but you don't need a cabinet to develop trans mediumship. But sometimes it's interesting to sit to experience a different energy. Yes. If you haven't got a cabinet, don't worry. <laughs> That's true. That is true. You know what? I actually, I'm just going to say, I actually got a, um, a portable kind of cabinet. And you'll see the picture if you see it in, in the Sacred Dancer transcript. But it was one of those portable pop-up, porta potty camping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's actually super cool. Um, so every once in a while, I'll put that, I'll put it open, and I'll go sit in there because I just want to feel that difference. And it is amazing. It, it really is amazing. Um, it's, it's an interesting experience, definitely, to sit within the cabinet to see the difference. But in the vast majority of my own development, I've not used the cabinet. I just sit. I just sit in. I, I sit in front of a screen, but I have the screen flat, if you like, just as a background. So if people are using their clairvoyant vision, they can see uh, the energies. If there's a lot of stuff going on behind you, it can detract. So to have a nice plain background. Is beneficial. So I put a screen behind me so people can, if you like, that's a nice neutral background to see against. Okay, that's good. That's a good, that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's definitely good. How important with you, I mean, I've, I've asked this question to a lot of the um, interviewees, how important is intention, protection, um, while developing mediumship? I mean, do you follow that? Is that something that you do? So, I guess with the intention, and I guess some people say you've got to give permission. Mm -hmm. And the guides themselves, they say they need to be invited to work with us. You know, they won't do things with us generally, apart from sometimes showing us our potential. But generally, they won't do things with us unless we've sent the invite. So, uh, you know, if we ask them to work with us, they will work with us. If we ask them to try and develop certain things with us, they'll do their best to do that. So there's definitely the invitation and the intention. The intention is very important. For me, at every circle we do, we always have an opening prayer and a closing prayer. And for me, the opening prayer sets the intention. And I always do the opening prayer at my own trans circle because I'm setting the intention for what I want to happen. So for me, I believe intention is very important. Protection. Now, this will horrify some of your listeners, but I don't do protection at all. Uh, I don't believe in protection because I believe we're naturally protected. I believe the natural law protects us. I believe my guides and helpers protect me. So I don't get excited about protection. And I think if we start talking about protection, it can bring in fear within people's minds. And it's like, what is that to be protected from? In this world, yeah, I get it. You know, shut your door at night, lock your door. Don't go into a neighborhood that may be unsafe. But when we move to work with spirit, I believe we're naturally protected. So I don't ever do, I don't ever ask for protection, never have. And it, I've never experienced anything that would ever frighten or scare me or would ever suggest I need protection. So 
for me, I don't get awfully excited about the protection side of things. Well, you know what I have noticed is that every time I talk to somebody outside of the U.S., they're exactly like you. They don't believe in protection. They don't do the chakras. They don't do certain things, you know, the opening, the closing, the chakras before you connect with spirit. I find, I thought that was so unusual because of course here, <laughs> that's what we're all about. Um, but I love that. I love how you said there's, I don't feel like I need to be protected because it's, I am already. So I love that. I'm glad it's that. Intention, you- intention to be protected. But coming back to what you said about, do you need to open and close your chakras? Well, I, I wouldn't know whether any of my chakras are open or closed, to be honest. I wouldn't know how to open or close them. We, I used to go to a circle where they used to tell us to close our chakras and imagine them turning off like lights or putting lids over them, saucepan lids over your chakras, so that when you walk out the room, you're switched off. But I know if you were switched off, you'd be dead. So, you know, I, for me, it comes back to what I was saying earlier on with Harry Edwards when he looked at, medium, at healing mediumship and he stripped away all the unnecessary stuff. When I look at mediumship, chakras are totally unnecessary. I've developed all my mediumship without ever worrying about chakras. Wow. You don't need to worry about them. Equally, I've developed my trance and all of the forms without ever worrying about protection. And it's never been a problem to me. So I strip all that stuff away because if you like, it's an optional add-on that some people add that makes it a bit more complicated. But if it generates fear, if it creates confusion within people's minds as to which chakra should I have switched on at the moment? How, I, I'm not sure if my chakras are on or off. Do you know, why bother? If it's going to create confusion, it seems to me to be a bit pointless. Well, <laughs> as I say, I, I'm really glad I'll probably, get flamed, I'll probably get flamed by a lot of the people watching this is a, you need to protect yourself. <laughs> Excuse me. No, I'm actually glad you brought that up because I have noticed a pattern and it's like, wow, you know, and it made me think, I think I was talking with Warren. Um, yes, I believe it was Warren and he was mentioning the same thing. Same with, I believe Aiden, Aiden Hall. And it made me think, I'm like, wow, I don't really need to do that. And it was just something that I learned that, you know, told you should do. And yeah. so I I started really thinking about that, questioning, questioning all these things. So you're helping me open up. You're helping me think a little bit more outside my box. Um, right. And I love that. Thank you so much for um, letting us know your, your views on this. And I, you, the other thing is as well, Kathy, in the, in the UK, many people receive training from uh, Arthur Finley College or the Arthur Finley College tutors. And pretty much every tutor I know at the Arthur Finley College, none of us teach protection. None of us. So really that, if you like, it's almost, I wouldn't say it's a policy, but it's pretty much getting there that, you know, we, we don't do protection because I believe it creates that fear within people. Mm-hmm. So again, a lot of people train within the UK. That's kind of how we train people. So that's why a lot of people, this side of the pond, think that way. Okay. Well, no, I, I actually love that. I, I think that is just important because, um, yeah, the moment you say something that you have to do a protection, it does instill fear. It does. Absolutely. Fear. So um, but I love that. I'm so glad you shared that with us. Um, how does it feel to blend with spirit? Um, just your interpretation. How does it feel if you can remember like your first time? Because typically the first time, I mean, I will not forget that. Um, how did it feel to you? Did you get frightened? Did, you know? Well, interestingly, I told you I went to the Spiritualist Church in um, 2001. And the first day I went, I got a message and I went to circle two weeks later, my very first circle, and they did a meditation to blend with spirit. And I was so overwhelmed by the energy. I just wanted to get out of that room and run away. Wow. The energy was so intense. And the, the tutor who was taking the circle at the time said that my guides came so very close to me that it was too much. And I have to tell them to back off and they need to back off. And whether that's really what happened or not, I don't know because at that point I hadn't developed a great deal, but I was very much aware of the absolute intensity of it. The very first time I gave spiritual healing, um, the intensity, the blending that took place, it, and it, the, the beauty of it, the emotion of it, the tears were streaming down my face because of the beauty and the love that I felt as I blended given healing. And again, that was my, if you like, my um, glimpse of potential that, hey, healing, look at the power and the, the love that takes place within healing. So those were two examples of very profound um, feelings I got during blending. 
And you know, what might people experience during blending? It's the whole range from nothing to intense, you know, the whole scale. And everybody gets something different. And at different stages in our development, we experience it differently. And I find it, it's almost very hard to say, what, what does blending with spirit feel like? Blending with spirit felt very differently to me when I used to sit in the power in the early stages versus sitting for trance versus how it feels sitting for trance now. And all that's in between. It, it, it progresses and it's different each time. And sometimes we get a calling card when we blend. In the early stages, I used to get a feeling of a hand on my shoulder was a calling card. I just feel this weight appear upon my shoulder. And it just felt like someone would rest their hand on my shoulder. And that was a calling card I had from one of my guides for a very long time, which I no longer get. Okay. So it's now, it's now disappeared. But with different guides, I feel different things. One guy gives me a great deal of energy around here. Another guide, I get a very much attention around the head. And when I'm sitting in the energy of spirit, best way I can describe it that I feel nearly all the time is like on a, a day when it's going to be a thunderstorm and you have that static. I very much have that static energy around me. I feel that. I very much feel it's kind of like an intense energy builds around. But what people experience is, you know, it's massive. And some people say, I experienced this and is it right? Is this what I'm meant to experience? And the answer is there are as many experiences as there are people. And we can never say any experience is the wrong experience or any experience is a bad experience. What you experience is unique to you. So everyone kind of needs to embrace their own experience and just accept it. And provided it's not what you perceive to be a negative experience, it's fine. But often if it is what you perceive to be a negative experience, generally it's to do with maybe your own fears related to it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you're very fearful or if you've been brought up, say, in a religious tradition where the spirit world, work deep, blending with the spirit world and doing mediumship is bad, people have a great deal of hang-ups and fears and they can provoke quite a lot of things. But generally in my experience, 99% of experiences are positive experiences. And the ones that seem to be not so positive generally have a reason behind them and turn out to be positive, really, if that makes sense. Yes. It's just how the person in the moment experiences it is not, they need to get an understanding of it later and look back and go, ah, now I get it. Um, when you said that you received your, um, the calling cards, the different calling cards, yeah. um, did you ask for them or did you just observe that, you, you know, when they, when they would come in, that that would always happen to you or you know, most people think that they should ask for the calling card. Um, do you find that to be true, that you should do that? Well, what tends to happen is, is what we, what we know, we start looking for. So say I, I've been trained and I, I, went, I went on courses for trance and physical in the early stages. I remember being on courses with quite a few mediums, Colin Fry and many others. And again, they talk about your guides each have a different energy signature or calling card. And you need to understand their own energy. So you then start going looking for it. It's natural to go looking for it and to diff, try and differentiate between them all. And, you know, this kind of, it kind of brings me into something I want to talk about anyway as part of this, this interview. So in the early stages, I would look to find a unique, specific calling card for each guide as best I could. And, yeah, you know, if you look for it, you'll find it. If that's what you believe you want, yeah, if you ask them, they'll give you it. And when with my own mediumship, with the development of trance with me, I started speaking and the guides would come through unique, one at a time. One would come in and speak and work and then go. And then the next one would come in and speak and work and go. You know, like that's how they work. That's how for most people in trance it works. And then they said to me, do you want to see how it really is? Or do you want to see how you want it? And I thought, wow. Wow. Because that, that's interesting. And I said, okay, show me how it really is. You know, I sent the thoughts to them. And what they showed me was they can blend with my mind as a group and different ones can work at different times without them having to like, if you like, come and physically occupy my body and go away again and have different sounding voices and different personalities. What happened was I then was looking for which guide is this? And I couldn't feel the calling cards. But then when certain information was coming out of my mouth, I'd realized that, ah, this is the one I call the scientist or, ah, this is the one I call the philosopher. But they kind of like could all blend at once. Wow. And what they said was, we come through one at a time for the benefit of the sitters and because that's how you want it. But if you want us, we can 
we're a, we're a blend of minds, a cooperative of minds, a collaboration of minds. And we can all blend together with your mind if we want to. And we can just let one to come to the surface, whoever wishes to speak, or we can kind of almost have one mouthpiece for all the thoughts going on. And then that kind of blew my mind. And I was like, okay. And then I thought, well, so I, that, that happened for quite a number of maybe a year or two that that happened and we lost the discrete guides. And now sometimes we have discrete guides come through and talk and sometimes we have the mix. It varies. But it, it, for me, what was interesting was they said, it's your need that we'll come one at a time, wow. not because it's what we want to do. And if you leave it to us, we'll do what we like as long as you're happy with it. But even now there's still a part of me, I guess I like them to come individually because you know, it's, it's nicer that way. You know for sure who's talking, but I don't always know who's communicating and they don't really announce themselves in my circle. And I don't believe in trying to assign names or archetypes to guides. I don't try and say, this one's a Native American because what happens is we're desperate to know who our guides are. We want to know, are they a Native American? Are they a monk? Are they a nun? <laughs> and what we can do is we can force them to be something they're not because it's our need. They will appear however we want them to appear. And the guides say, I am not this, but you have a need for me to appear as this. So I will appear as it to appease your need, but this is not who I am. Wow. Yeah, you know what? You're making me think now. I mean, yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's what I want to perceive when really, you know, they're just giving me that, that way. Now you're Absolutely. making me question everything now. I could be sitting there later <laughs> today going, um, I mean, I have circle tomorrow. So I'm like, I'm gonna, we're going to be talking about this video here. Um, very. You know, I, I love thinking about things. And, you know, people ask me questions. Can you do trance with your eyes open? What is you that? Know? You're answering everything. I'm, I'm at, I have all these questions. That was another one I was going to ask you. I forgot to mention. So you're, you're completely doing it. And, you know, in my experience, and I asked other tutors at the Arthur Finley College, do you know anyone who just trance with their eyes open? And the general consensus was no. I think someone could remember only one person they believed to be genuinely in trance with their eyes open. So I said to the guides, come on. We need to experiment. Let's, let's at the next circle. I want you to take me into trance and open my eyes and let's see what happens. And they could keep me in a state of trance if they open my eyes an absolute tiny bit and we could talk and we could provide my vision didn't focus on anything. It was just like a little bit of light seeping in. But as soon as my eyes open to a certain degree whereby the eyes focused, bang, it whips me out of it. And it's because it, they said, generally, we won't do it with your eyes open because it will bring you back to the process. It will bring your mind back. It will bring you back to the room. It's not helpful. So generally, it's better to do trance with your eyes shut because we're trying to suppress the mind. And in suppressing the mind, we really don't want anything coming into the senses externally, like, uh, like your vision. Obviously, you'll hear what's going on in the room. But again, it's like they kind of, and then you ask the question, you, or you might ask the question of me, how does it feel when you are in trance? <laughs> yes. Is that, is, that, is that one of them? Yes, that is. <laughs> you know, and, and for me, different mediums will say different things. Some people say they're completely out of it, and I'm not completely out of it. I hear what's going on because I think I'm nosy. Yes. And, you know, spirit wants, I, I said to them, I want to know what it feels like to be completely out of it. Again, remember, experiment with them. So in the earlier stage of development, I said, well, I hear some people go out of it totally. Next time I'm sitting, can you try and take me out of it totally? And boy, I didn't like it. You know, I actually felt as if they were trying to kill me. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. You know, if you're going to be chloroformed, if you, you know, if you like, you go to the, we used to go to the dentist as children and put a mask on us and cl effectively chloroform us oh my God. and knock you out. And it felt like I was being knocked out and I didn't like it. Wow. And I said, I said, whoa, That's no. It. I want a part of me present to a degree because that, that doesn't feel right. I really don't like that feeling. I'd like a part of me, however small, to still be in the mix. And so that's how they do it. That's what I need as a person. So, hey, we'll work with you. We'll do you know, whatever you need, we'll do. So they showed me that going out completely was not really a good idea for me. So I hear what's said. I'm aware of what they're talking about. I can't always recall. It's a bit like a dream, really. Afterwards, I can't always recall exactly what's said. I can't always recall the order of what's said, but I have a recollection of what takes place. And the longer I leave it, the less I can recollect, a bit like a dream. And it's an altered state of awareness. We must remember that. But I do hear the words being said. And sometimes I think, oh, that's interesting. That's not, that's not what I would say. And the guy would say as well, if, if it's a topic that I have very strong views upon myself, 
my own mind starts to surface too much and interfere and they don't like it because I, because they can't suppress it. The, the guides say they use the power that the sitters provide to suppress my mind. That's what they use to suppress me. So they need that power to help suppress me, my, my mind and keep my mind out of it and take me to a place where I need to be. And it's, you know, it's, it's a joint thing. I willingly go, I willingly allow myself to go into the background, to go into another room whilst they then step forward and speak through me. If you like, I'm kind of temporarily vacating my mind for them to use it, but I still have some degree of awareness is how I describe it. But at different times I sit, the degree of awareness can change. And even within the same time sitting, it can go up and down. Sometimes I can be very aware of what's being said. And sometimes I think my mind's too involved. I need to get out of this somehow. Can you take me down lower? And I may send the thoughts to the guides. Look, we need to change something. And we can. That is very interesting to me because I mean, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking of my own experiences and going, okay, I totally get that. I totally get that. Um, I've not experienced, I've never asked them to completely take me out. <laughs> now with hearing that, I'm not quite sure if I would like to even bother with that one. But I do understand when you say um, being a little bit nosy. I tend to sometimes want to know what's happening. You know, I want to observe things and then I realize, oh, breathe. You know, let me, let me go down, you know. Um, and I'm also um, paying attention a lot to the sensations. I'm very clairsentient. So I'm very aware yeah. of the calling cards. And then um, for you to say that you used to get them, then all of a sudden you stopped getting them. Is that, was that just with all of the people that were coming forward with you? Or mm -hmm. it just naturally... Well, I think that's how it naturally progressed because I guess in the early stages, if they're not talking, you're looking for some other sign they're around. But when they're talking, you kind of go, hey, I know who this is. I, you know, I'm not looking for a calling card. So, so to a certain degree, you st I stopped looking, I would say. The energy is the same. But again, it's, maybe you get used to the energy that you don't really need. You don't feel, a, you don't feel it strongly. And B, you don't need it because, hey, you, you're used to them talking. Now, coming back to what I just spoke about um, when I felt they were chloroforming me. Now, anybody listening to this, they say, hey, there's a bad experience. <laughs> See, it, it did happen. But what, one thing I would say is that as a child, I had to have a lot of teeth out and I was forced to go to the dentist. And it was very traumatic for me to be, um, I was told as a child that all my teeth had rotted because of eating too much sugar. And I found out quite a long time later that actually I had to have all my teeth out by gas because my baby teeth were too strong and the adult teeth couldn't get through. So they had to remove them all. But it traumatized me for a little while, you see. And within me, it created, it created an issue within me. That them taking me in that way brought that back up within me. And this is why the more we can address our own issues, the better it is. So it wasn't because it was a bad experience. What it was doing, the experience was touching something that existed within me, a traumatic experience from my past, and was bringing it in. It wasn't that what they were doing in terms of taking me out of it was bad. It's just my own perception of what was happening. I got worried. I kind of got, whoa, hang on. This takes me back to childhood. So it was about me, not about the spirit world doing anything bad. Mm -hmm. And I'll share another experience is sometimes this can happen to people. The experience when you're falling off to sleep and you fall like you're dropping. You're familiar with that? When you're just dropping off to sleep and all of a sudden it feels like you're dropping and you jolt awake. That can happen as we go into trance as well. And again, if that happens, we can just ask spirit to change something next time. If the energy is too intense, we're in control. We can send thoughts to those who work with us. Please change something. I'm finding the energy too intense. So remember, we should always remember we're the ones in control. And those who work with us, they want to work with us for the long term. They don't want to upset us or, or create any problems for us. They will do what we wish. They'll work the way we want. So... You know, sometimes people experience the things and say, well, I tried to do trance and it just felt so bad. I'm never going back to it. Well, no, go back to it and ask them to change something. You know, I like that. I like that a lot because in the beginning, when I wanted to really feel them, I asked them, give it to me strong because I'm a feeler. So I'm, <laughs> I want it strong so I can, I can feel that. And then I did realize after, the, oh, after time, okay, you can, you can lower it. You so. can t turn the volume down, please. It's too high. It's like, give it to me strong. No, no, not that strong. <laughs> Yes, yes. And that's good for people to know as they're starting their journey or, or developing. So they can, they can ask questions, ask questions yeah. to their guides and ask, their, ask them to do things, you know, tone things down. So it's very important. Absolutely. Um, I know that 
we are having this great conversation. So I'm trying to look at my questions and make sure that you didn't already a answer a lot of these. Um, I know we touched a little bit about this. I wanted to talk about um, this, the, you know, see, I'm, I'm looking at them now and I'm like, wait, he answered that one and that one. Um, why would building the power in a group be important? I know uh, you missed a little bit, but I wanted to talk yeah. more about that. So if you're going to sit to develop trans, really, you know, one, one question I have is some people ask me, can you sit to develop trans online? And, you know, and I, and so again, I, I think, well, this is my idea of the answer, but then I go, hang on a minute. Next time I'm doing a trans circle, let's get them to ask that question of the guides and let's see what the guides want to say about it. And, you know, you can sit in a group and build power. You can do all that pre work of building power. You can learn to blend. In inspirational work, you can receive information, uh, a flow of inspiration from the guides and helpers who work with you. And we can get to that state. But in terms of actual taking the trance to a deeper level, then we actually need physical sitters within the room, is my belief and what also the guides tell me. So to really go beyond, you, you can get to a state maybe of light trance by doing trance within an online group. But the other problem you've got is you need observers. You need people to observe the energy. And you can't observe energy through a webcam the way you can through your own energy, through your own, through your own clairvoyance. Your clairvoyance will feel the energy and translate it into imagery, to lights, to colors. But when you look at a webcam, you can't do that. You can't have to tune into the person and trying to guess almost what's happening mm -hmm. online versus feeling it for real in the room. And similarly, clairsentience doesn't transmit very well through a webcam. You could remotely try and tune into what's happening, but again, it's not as good. It's not likely to work as well. So you, I'm not saying you can't do it, but you, it will be to a degree limiting. It will limit you as far as you can get. So really the best way to develop chances to have people within the room, to have sitters. And those sitters, if you like, they're giving the power. And before every trans circle we, I, I do, my own trans circle, we all come together and we all sit for maybe 10, 15 minutes beforehand for several reasons. The first one is to calm our minds, to let go of all the issues of the day, to blend with spirit, but to blend as a group, to blend and create a harmony between us and also to build power for the guides and helpers to use with the trance state. So it has a multi-purpose. And then whilst we're doing trance, the sitters are giving energy to the process also. So the, the kind of, the, we, we all build the power to begin with. And then when we're working, they're still taking power from the sitters. And it's, when you do physical, it's even more so, they're taking that power from the sitters. Uh, so the, the coming together is very important. But I'd say to come together as a group is vital. To come together as a harmonious group is vital. And I, 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 I'm thinking how much I share now because I don't want anyone who listens to this who used to sit with me to be bothered <laughs> about what I'm saying. But I've sat with varying different groups of people over, over the time in various circles. And if there's not a harmony within the group or if there's, any, if there's ever any jealousy or so, he's doing that and I'm not, that really destroys the harmony within the group. I'm not saying that ever happened, but if it's there, that will destroy it. But even if people don't gel well with other people in the group, it affects the energy. You really want people who are friends, people who like each other. I'd go so far as to say people who love each other, but not you know, in a spiritual way that we, you know, we love the souls that they are. Yes. And that's really the kind of the harmonious condition we need for trans. And the way you come together before a circle is sit to blend with each other, sit to build that power. And as I said, it's funny that the people I originally started sitting with, that the trans circle kind of evolved and then we had a core that stayed there moving forward for quite a number of years. And those people were the people who I sat with in our power circle for sitting to build power. And we would built that harmony between us we built that energy between us and it was already there. It was already, it was already a beautiful thing we'd built. So I think it is very useful. But then people think, well, hey, sitting for trance is easy. I'll just get some random people together and I'll sit. And it's like, if the energy is not right within the room, it will really restrict what spirit is capable of doing. If we don't build the power, it will restrict it. And interestingly, when the, when the circle settled out with the people who stayed within it, that's when, if you like, there was almost like an increase in the quality of what took place, the quality of what was said, the length of time I started to speak for then went up a great deal. 
Like now the guides typically talk for an hour and a quarter to an hour and a half on each sitting. Wow. So, you know, but back then in the early days, you know, if I spoke for more than 10 minutes, you were doing well. So <laughs> I think so over time it progresses. Okay. And that's good. That's good for people to know that if it's only a short amount of time at first, it could build and get uh, to and be longer. Uh, absolutely. And you I know, it's, that. you've got to be in it for the long haul with trance. You, there's no quick fix. You know, it's for me, it's a, it's a long journey of development. And the other question is, can everybody develop trance? Mm -hmm. That's just came to my head now as if that, I need to talk about that as part of this. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that everyone can develop what I call evidential mediumship to some degree, to some standard, whether that's just giving a link in circle or whether that's maybe just doing some sittings amongst friends to give evidence from loved ones. But not everyone will go on to be a platform medium. Not everyone will go on to be someone who's able to do sittings, you know, multiple sittings in a row and be paid for it. Not everyone may develop it to that degree. But when it comes to trance, it's, I'd say there's even less people who will go on to develop trance to, a, a, to a, a good level for several reasons. The first reason is the length of time it takes to do it and the commitment needed. And you have to be drawn to it. Yes. I'd say that anybody who can develop evidential mediumship to a reasonable standard is capable of developing trance to a good standard because it's just a continuation of the attunement. Similarly with healing, if you're a good healer, you can develop trance because it's a continuation of your attunement. If you work with spirit inspiration and you're receiving that inspiration, that's that attunement, you're blending it, you're taking it further, you're moving it on. So if you're working with spirit in some way, then yes, you can take it on. But the usual the pitfall with most people is they don't want to sit for years. I want instant results. I'd like to get the result within months. I I'm not willing to, to, you know, as I say, I didn't start speaking until maybe six months, even you know, I know We'd seen I could speak years earlier. It was there. The potential was there. But if you like, I had to do the work then to create the conditions to unfold it, to make it happen. I, as I say, it's like, here's your potential. Now go away and put the time and the effort in and show us you're serious. Show us you're serious about developing it. Mm -hmm. And a lot, for a lot of people, you know, a lot of people fall by the wayside with developing evidential mediumship. And even more will fall by the wayside with trans. But if you're drawn to it, if you really feel it's something you can do, I believe, yeah, you've gone to develop it to, to a degree. It's all degrees, you see. Mm -hmm. And, but again, in the early stages, what may be spoken, maybe, forgive you'll forgive the expression dross. It's not a particularly of a high standard. And we have to learn to work through that to allow the good stuff to come. And we shouldn't be disillusioned by the speech that isn't brilliant. And for me, I get very worried about people wanting to compare and wanting to judge other people's trance. I, I'm, I, I get very nervous about people ever wanting to judge trance because I went along in my very first experience in 1996 as someone who didn't understand. And I judged that man and I judged his trance and I judged his physical mediumship with no real understanding or knowledge. And it's so easy to do. And other people say, well, I know what trance is and that's not trance or in, but actually the person's at a stage in their development where that has to be happening. We have to sit through that. We have to watch that. We have to let it happen. We have to let it come for the better stuff to come later. It's a necessary stage of the unfoldment of it. And if you take your trans public too soon, that can be a real challenge because, you know, if people are watching who don't understand, they can be very critical and they can say some quite cruel things and it can destroy people as with all mediumship, really. And so that's why you need trusted sitters who are not going to be judging you, who are not going to be comparing, who are not going to be getting jealous like you've, hey, you did something fabulous and I haven't. So I'm really upset that you, you're good and I'm not. And that really starts to affect the energy. And so it's not a good thing. Not a good thing. And, uh, you know, jealousy is definitely going to break the harmony of any circle. And sometimes, like, I realized that the very first circle I was in, certain people joined whose energy I didn't really get along with. And... I felt disharmonious and I just said, it's me guys. I don't really feel right. I'm going to have to go. And I didn't say it's you guys. It's like, no, cause it's not them. It's, it's how other people's energies make me feel. It's about me. It's all about me. Yes. We have to, we have to own our own stuff. We have the personal responsibility. And so if it doesn't feel right in a circle for me, and I really feel I'm not meant to be there. I will go, but I won't blame anybody. I'll just say it's where I am. It's where I need to be. It's what I need to do. And so, Definitely competition can be a challenge. People judging where people are at. And 
I also used to feel quite nervous if I went on a course, say, at the Arthur Finley College. And I've been to the Arthur Finley College many, many times as a student, maybe over 35 times, 35 weeks as a student, quite a lot. So, and in some courses, we'd sit to do trance. Maybe that wouldn't be the main course, but we'd sit and we'd go down. And, and if someone spoke, everybody else in that class, maybe the 15 are all kind of judging it. Was it good? Was it bad? And it used to bother me because I kind of like feel, well, my trance is very personal to me. And I don't really like anybody, um, if you like, if I let you see it, it's, I want it to be on my terms. Does that make sense? I guess I'm a control freak. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> but I, I, I recognize that, you know, other people judging us, other people saying things about us can be very hurtful and can destroy it. It can just, you know, we need to nurture and encourage the ability. We don't want people saying, I've watched you and that's not trance. And I hear, I've heard some tutors say to people, you know, that's not spirit. That's not trance. You're not able to do trance. And the person is destroyed and goes away. Whoa. And I feel it's not fair to do that. I don't really feel anyone can judge where anybody else is at on the basis of seeing them just once or twice, you know? So I, I think we have to be very careful about not judging people. Yeah. And that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I'm, all, I, I'm all about really, I want people to be nurtured. I want people to be encouraged. I want people but equally, if they're totally disillusioned, we have to be honest and say, that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, we still got to have, we still have to have our rational approach to it. Yeah, you know, some people are very deluded and, and, and sometimes there's a fine line between doing trance and sometimes having uh, mental challenges within our, within our mind. Some people can be very deluded. Some people can hallucinate quite and it, believe it to be something it's not. And we have to be honest about that, but in a nice way, in a caring way, in a loving way. It's, you know, the job of a teacher to try and pull someone up with that is not an easy thing to do. But, um, so it's, it's finding that balance, finding the balance. And you know what, you brought up a lot of things that are very important. Um, I, I wanted to go back to your first experience when you first sat in circle and you started speaking. Um, you were new in that circle. Did the members there, I mean, did they start getting jealous, get upset? Um, this is what I'm saying. Sometimes I'm trying to think about how much I can say to protect people. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> oh, totally get it. I mean, so, I would feel that that they, would be Well, you know, I guess if I'm in their shoes, this guy who's really, you know, he's only six months into his development journey. He's really new. He, does, he hasn't done anything. He's not even a working medium. And he comes and he sits and he starts talking. What's that about? Mm -hmm. You know, and... You could easily see that some people may not feel comfortable with that, or some people may feel threatened by that, or some people may feel, well, I'm not even speaking yet, and how come he did it? And so it, it, I, I think that created an energy within that circle that, if you like, was, it was part, still part of the mix why I, I think at the end I still felt it wasn't right for me, because that happened and made, made me feel a little bit uncomfortable, to be truthful, because a lot of these guys are working platform mediums and, you know, been doing trans for years. And I come along and I just, hey, what's going on with him? <laughs> and then it's, I guess, to a certain degree, we want him to sit to give energy for us. And now he'll want us to give energy to him to develop his trance. And it kind of starts to, it starts to create a dynamic in the group that was not the intention. So, yeah. And these things do happen. You know, and I will say that what happens within a lot of circles is you have, say, six people sit and the energy that we build goes in six different directions and no one really progresses very much. So the fewer people who sit in a circle, the better, because the less people you're sharing the power amongst and the more time they get to work. So, and what you'd really love, what the ideal thing is for a trans circle is to have sitters who just give their love, who don't want to develop trans, who just come there to give their love to you. And I've been very blessed in my own circle to have sitters like that, one of whom is my wife, luckily, which is wonderful. That's how she is. She doesn't want to develop her trance, but she loves, she loves the trance circle and she loves just giving her power and her, her energy and her love to it. And if you can get sitters, they're like gold dust, honestly. I can't speak highly enough of people who are willing just to be there for others, to give their love for others, just to be a part of somebody else's development journey without wanting to be in the chair themselves, without wanting to be developing themselves. Because if everyone wants to develop, we have to split the energy up and it will slow it down. And in the end, the circle I was in only had two of us who were developing and other people were just giving their power. And that was better.
because really there's only two of us get to sit and the energy is only split in two directions. Does that make sense? So, you know, it's much, it's much easier. You know and, what? I just don't know. Okay. Um, I don't see that happening too much here where see uh, people will come and sit and just give their love and, and be there doing the power. They, that, that's not really here. I mean, in my awareness with my groups, no, everybody wants to develop. Everybody wants to be the medium. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, nobody um, wants to be the supporting act. They all want to be the, be the, yeah. be the lead actor. Mm -hmm. But actually what's very interesting as well is when you sit in a circle and you give your power and your love, to what the process of what's taking place in trance, you are actually being developed at the same time. Because by giving that act of service and being blended with the spirit, Gordon Higginson, a man who I, I get very passionate about, and for anybody who doesn't know, I've built a website about Gordon Higginson called www.gordonhigginson.co.uk, and you can go and see him, hear him. But he always used to say that no time spent in the presence of spirit was ever wasted. And I love those words. Okay, no yeah. time spent in the presence of spirit is ever wasted. So even if you're just sitting, you're being developed. Even if you're just sitting, you're growing as a soul. But yeah, I get it. I get it. It's the same here, you know, to find people who are willing to sit for you. If you can find people who are willing to sit, grab them, yes. cherish them. They are like gold dust. They are wonderful. Uh -huh. They are wonderful. I, you know, I wanted to go back on about the online. So here in the US, um, like in my group, the Sacred Dancer Trance, um, you know, I created a place where people could also come to and connect with each other, um, hopefully join and create their own physical circles as long as they live near each other. But also we have to have that option of online because a lot of people don't have, like where you are, my God, there must be, it must just be everywhere. Everybody loves, everybody wants to do it or, or support it. Here, you know, some people live and there's nobody near them. And so we do offer the off online. And I like how you said that. Um, yes, you might be able to develop to some degree. Um, it is better to be in a physical circle. And, um, and so, but I like how you mentioned that. I like how you said that you can still do it, but it will be to a degree that you can, yeah. um, especially with inspirational or, or um, healing, but not maybe so much as the physical. Is that what you said, right? Well, the, the physical, physical mediumship, remember, is it's a rare ability to find within people. And it, if the amount of time it takes to develop trance, you have to extend it a great deal further to develop physical. Yes. I think Gordon Higginson said it took 10 years of sitting to develop his physical. So, you know, he'd be speaking in trance probably, I would think, within months. But to be getting really decent phenomena within a circle, well, you're talking yes. a, group of, a group of people sitting for 10 years. So, you know, physical, I, I would be very surprised if people are getting physical phenomena in online circles within a short space of time. And, yeah, yeah. And, even, and even within circles that come together to sit, you know, often people sit for not sit, nothing happens. You know, the, the problem with sitting for physical for many people is they sit and nothing happens and they get bored of it. And it's like, geez, how many, how many months or years have I got to sit with nothing happening? <laughs> At least with trans, people can talk and it's interesting and words are said and you can be involved in the process. Yeah. So it takes real committed sitters to go for physical. So online, yeah, I, I get that people can get an experience. I get that you can develop inspiration. I get that you could develop light trans. And, you know, if you ask me, you know, can I, do, can I do trans now with just myself and a camera and no people here? I would argue that I could probably do it for a while because I built that power within for them to communicate. We have that relationship that they can communicate, but I think it would peter out pretty quickly. I wouldn't be able to do an hour. I might manage 10 minutes, say. So, it, you know, it could be done without physical sitters, but it would be, it wouldn't be anywhere near what's capable of with physical sitters. Um, so it can be done to a degree. I know that, but equally I find as well, I, I sometimes sit, for inspiration for myself. I, it's not a trans circle. I just sit, I, I grab my audio recorder, I make it, put it on and I just sit and I, and I let what comes forward. But I'm aware that it's, a, it's what I would call an inspirational speaking state. It's not what I would call the trance. It's a, it's a lighter state. I'm still inspired, I'm still aware which guides are talking, but it's, and that's what I would more equate with sometimes what I see in channeling. And I can move much more in my body. I'm not kind of like really, when, when I sit within my circle, I don't move other than my head. I don't move my hands generally. And other than my head, my body sits absolutely rigid still for an hour and a half. Wow. 
you know, and when I, oh, when I come back, boy, my joints are stiff and it hurts a bit when I first come back. But my body is just totally still. Now they have experimented and they can move their hands if they want to, but they say that takes power to do that. So we'd rather conserve the power for the speech rather than animating the body, if you will, because, and some people think, you know, Gordon Higginson, a wonderful medium. I've got some uh, video footage that I uploaded to YouTube of him where he in trance walks around the room. But what people have to understand with Gordon Higginson was he was claustrophobic and he was a physical medium and he didn't like to get into the cabinet because he was claustrophobic. So they take him into trance first and they learn to walk him into cabinet. So there was a reason he developed walking because it was vital to his, to his development of physical mediumship. So he was a trans medium for, for a lot earlier than he ever developed physical, but they then within his trans mediumship then developed, if you like, animating his body to move it into the cabinet because that was a necessary step to overcome his uh, claustrophobia. Wow. So, but if there isn't a reason to move you around the room, they generally don't want to do it because it takes such a lot of time and effort to do that. That why would they spend ages seeking to develop a skill with a medium that's not necessary? So when I'm doing a light inspirational state, I can do much more in my body if I wanted to. But when I'm in trance, it's like the body's, if you like, the body's uh, being rested up and the <laughs> mind's being sent out the, at the room as well. And then they're coming in there and they're using my head, my voice, and just the top part of my body to speak. And very occasionally they may move their hands, but not very often. So for maybe an hour to an hour and a half, you will just be absolutely just your head moving, if anything? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you and, all, and also sometimes they, uh, they, they're quite naughty. I, I have problems sometimes with my neck. I had a car accident where I got T-boned and you got the whiplash. Mm -hmm. And I'd been going to see an osteopath for a great deal of time um, to get, help get this sorted out. And it never truly has sorted, as after any accident, it never fixes. Mm -hmm. But when I come out of trance, there's always a huge crack in the room and it's my neck. Wow. And they always manipulate my neck just as I'm coming out. And I come out and my neck feels great. Wow. <laughs> and they do, a, they do a little bit of spiritual osteopathy on my neck when I'm bringing <laughs> me out. It's, it's hilarious. And after every time, there's always this crack and it's my neck. I mean, so does it, and you feel better for forever after that until the next time you go in and... <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it kind of builds up and... Wow. And, you know, I, I used to go and see the osteopath probably every month and I've not been to see him for well over six months now. And he must wonder what happened to me. Why is he not there? He must need some more work. And oh, spirit are working on my neck. That's, that's awesome. That is it amazing. Is. Yeah, and if, we, if we've got anything wrong with us, when we spend that time with spirit, remember they will work on us. They will help us if we need healing. When you're blended, you'll get healing as well. You know, so trance has got so many fabulous benefits for us. I come out after having done trance and feel a lot uh, more energized and a lot, just a lot more comfortable, relaxed and happier afterwards, always, just with healing, same with healing. Whenever I do healing afterwards, I feel great. And it's the same with trance. So we get these extra benefits that they, you know, people say, why develop trance? But there's so many extra secondary benefits from it. It's great. No, I love it. I love that. Uh... You make it sound beautiful. You make it sound that it is, it is beautiful. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, it does, you know, um, I wanted to ask you an interesting question. I do pose this to some members because I've read this. Um, have you, I've heard that elemental energy is needed um, in trance. Have you ever experienced this? Experienced this? Now, I wouldn't even know what elemental energy was. <laughs> okay. Okay. And if you say it's uh, energy from the elementals yes. and energy from like the fairies or the elves or the, you know, it blows my mind. And I go, I take you back to my Harry Edwards approach to mediumship. Do I need it? Does it help me understand mediumship? And the simple answer is no. So stuff like that, I, I just kind of go, elemental energy, it just sounds mad. Leave it alone. You know, and... <coughs> well, I did want to ask you that. <laughs> And so I like to ask everybody that question. And actually, I think I forgot to ask that question a couple to a couple of people. Um, I tell you, I, I don't do fluff, and that for me, that starts to get into the region of what I call that in the beginning. You know, and if some if some people do, then that's great, and I'm happy with them having their own understanding. But you know, for me, it just I don't re I don't really experience any of that. So, you know, I just think, well, I've got to where I am, and all the people I know whose mediumship I 
value, who, who've taught me, who's trans I value, none of them ever mentioned that word as well, elemental energy. So I think, well, all the people I know who do it really well don't talk about it. So, hey, <laughs> not, not needed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So we have cross. Um, there's, you know, like I said, I think I had like 27 questions. And I know I didn't ask 27 because you answered quite a few of them. Um, but I know I have a few, uh, maybe a couple more that I wanted to we, I know you talked about this. Is trans, developing trans a fast process? Is this something you can do, <laughs> take a class, and then oh, yes. call yourself a trans medium after that? After Good the point. weekend workshop, can you do that? Is yeah. that? I'd love to say yes, but you know I'm not going <laughs> to. Okay. You know, how long would it take someone to develop trans? You know, it kind of comes back to what I was saying at the beginning about the right conditions mm -hmm. and the right timing. If someone's at the very right place, then yeah, it may unfold very rapidly indeed. Somebody, I believe, Morris Barbonell, it did unfold quite rapidly within a matter of months for him. Wow. And, you know, so quickly it's possible. But for mere mortals, I'd say you're looking at, to be able to develop to a level where spirit can speak through you sensibly. We're talking years. And for it to develop to a really high standard that you go, wow then you're kind of looking at a minimum five-year period, maybe near a 10, I don't know. I, I don't really like to put time frames on anything because there's always, if you like, you can have, it's like a bell curve. See, I'm a scientist, you have a bell curve. For most people, it's in the middle, but you can have outliers on either end. Some people may take 20 years, other might take three months. So, you know, it's hard to say, but in general, I'd say that most people developing evidential mediumship, we say give it a good three years to five years to become a good platform medium. To develop, to become a good trans medium, I'd say double it, you know. And again, you've got to be in it for the long haul. You've got to, be, you've got to put the time and effort in. You've got to sit for spirit. You've got to sit in the trans circle. You've got to sit to do it. If you don't sit in the trans circle and expect trans to develop, then you're mad. <laughs> Why would it develop if you're not putting the time and the effort in? And with my own development, I used to sit monthly and then it moved more to two to three times a month at the moment. And the, the more you sit, the more it progresses, generally. It's giving spirit the time to work. It's a two-way thing. They can't work with us unless we give them the time. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I, um, um, most of the interviewees say the same thing. It's dedication. The absolutely. Of Patience, happen, dedication. All of that. And as long as you're doing that and making that commitment because you want to, and it's really the intention as well, yeah. um, then it could just, everything could start opening up. But yes, I do agree with the time that it does take time. And I do want, that's why I wanted to mention to, um, it's an important question to, I, that I asked because I want people to understand that it's not something they can just do like that. And, and if you happen to be one of those super, super, you know, meant to be, have to do it right now, um, that opens up naturally. And again, you know, three months or whatever, but typically it is a long time that you have to sit and develop. Yeah. Uh, and I want people to understand that because this way they don't get discouraged because some people are just going to, you know, they're so excited and all of a sudden they stop and they don't want to do it anymore. And, you know, the more knowledge you have about what you're getting into, what you want to do, the better. And I'd say as well that, you know, the, um, the progression with it is not a straight line. It doesn't always get better. It has its peaks and its troughs. Sometimes you feel like you're going backwards. And sometimes you feel like my trance last year was better than this year. And this year it just seems to have gone to pot. And, <laughs> and what's happening is you're changing. And what's happening is how they learn to work with you is changing. And you're going through a process of continual development. And sometimes it looks like it's going backwards when it's not. And sometimes our expectations are unreasonable. Or we expect it to stay the same. And when it starts to change, you know, when, my, when they started working with me by not being discrete personalities and starting to blend, but one part of me still didn't like it. And I kind of thought to myself, you know, if ever I have to do a public trans dem, this will not match anyone's expectations of what happens. And they all say, that's not how you do trans. Because I do do a very occasional public trans demonstrations. I have done them in the past. If people have been booked to come and do a trans demonstration and don't show up, Sometimes I've been roped up to be, hey, you can do trans, you go do it. <laughs> and, and I'm always wary, what will people think of it? And so at that point in time, I'm kind of thinking, well, people will not think this is how it's meant to be. Even though I know they're showing me this as part of my development and it's a natural step in my own development. 
And so, you know, and even to a certain degree, I was thinking, am I really happy with how they're doing it now? But we have to just accept and just let the process happen. So we have to recognize that sometimes we can have a huge stride forward and then there's a consolidation phase where nothing seems to happen or heaven forbid, it seems that we get that initial spurt where it all comes into harmony and it works really well. And then all of a sudden it's like, hang on a minute, now you've got to work to recover that position. And that's when people say, this is not working for me. I'm off now. And that's why if you like some spirit, I believe sometimes test our commitment to it as well. Test our dedication to the cause to see, are we willing to put in the hard work and effort needed to stay the course? Gordon Higginson always used to say, many are called, many, many, many are called, but few are chosen. And the way I interpret that is that many initially want to do it, but not everyone will stay the course. And it's you yourself who choose. It's the chosen part that's coming from you, not spirit. They don't choose who their workers are. It's we, we choose whether we're going to stay the course and work with them. That makes sense. It makes absolute sense, and you said it beautifully. Um, I would like you to add, I know you mentioned that you um, built a page. Is it for, you built a separate page for, yeah. um, okay. If you can I, also attach that so people can connect with that um, page that you have as well. Yeah, I, I, can, I can give information relating to my, my own page, personal page, where all my videos are located, and there's, there's currently 23 of them. There's a lot. Each one lasts about two hours, sometimes even three hours. Yeah. And then... And then I also have a, a study program. It's like, it's like a home study program that like you do in your own time. You get the videos. There's each class, all the, all the videos, there's a, there's a corresponding tutorial that go with it. And then there's like four modules, which have five videos and five tutorials in it. And I also am I'm just bringing on stream now some live classes as well, live support classes for those doing that. So you can ask me questions with your development, whatever you're finding happening. If you want to come and ask me about it, you can. So I'll post the link to that as well. And yes, all the links that you want, I want everybody to be able to connect because everything that we've been talking about, especially your, your, uh, the services that you offer. Sure. Um, and I really, um, like I said, I know I go over about your videos. I, I love them. Um, I quite like them too. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I do recommend them a lot. So I'm so glad Wonderful. that I put you on here. Um, I want to ask you one final question. I actually, sure. don't know what you've answered it, but I'm still going to ask you one more time. Is there any final advice that you'll give to someone starting this journey, this, this trans journey? Um, that's a good well, I, I, I guess with, it's what the same answer I give to everyone, anyone starting any journey of work with spirit is for me, it is a beautiful journey and it is all about the journey. It's, you, you never arrive at the destination. You know, we never, we, you know, we never make it that that's the level we're going to achieve. I believe that we can always progress until the moment we transition to spirit. And then we'll progress in the spirit world, learning even more. So we'll never stop learning. So don't treat it as a destination to get to and try and rush to your destination. I would say, enjoy how the journey unfolds for you. Enjoy every step of it. Enjoy the time you spend with spirit. Love it and love spirit. Because, you know, for me, I love the spirit world. I love the work I do with spirit. And I know the love that they bring for me. Everything I've ever had in trance that they've given me, their advice has been spot on. Wonderful. Like I was saying to you, I get healing when I work with them. They do so much for us. It's, you know, it re my, my guides love to say it's a conscious cooperation of souls. That's what they love to say. This work is a conscious cooperation of souls. We choose to consciously work with them and they choose to consciously work with us. And together we're walking this pathway. And it's a pathway of service. And for me, service is all about love. If you just approach it from the mechanics, you will limit your ability to develop. If you approach it because you want to get to the destination and you want a badge saying you're a medium or you're a trans medium or you're a healer, you'll limit your development. When you've treated it, come at it from love, compassion and service, the sky's the limit. The sky is really the limit. And so, you know, embrace it, do it. What are you waiting for? It's a wonderful journey. That's what I'd say. Very, very inspiring. I am so grateful that you took a time on your Saturday. To, <laughs> and, and I think we are, what, five hour difference between yep. us? Um, that you took the time today. 
Um, I am so grateful to you for sharing all this beautiful information. And um, I just, I'm just so excited. I'm probably going to have to watch this video over and take more notes. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, I'm seriously going to do it. Um, I know that um, you took your time to do this and I just, I really just am so grateful. I no, it's my pleasure. And you know, I, for me, I, again, it comes back to what I'm about. I, I love to make quality teachings available to as many people as possible, wherever they are in the world with the least barriers of access, whether that's geography, whether that's time, whether that's money. Sure, I may charge something for some of the things I do, but hey, we all have rent to pay or mortgages to pay, but I, I don't like to charge too much. For me, I'd like to put it out there that here you are, here's information that may help you. And if only, pe only thing people ever learn about trans is what we've discussed about today, I think that'd be a pretty good foundation. Wow. So, yeah, I'm happy to do it. Oh my gosh. You guys, please check out his website. He will post all his links in the comments. I will. <laughs> um, and just check him out. I mean, amazing, amazing soul. Uh, wonderful teacher. I can tell you that right now, just from videos. Um, but again, Martin, thank you again. I wish yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Rest of your day and weekend and hopefully we can connect again soon. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Kathy. Take care. You too.